Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lin Xiaoyue. I'm a graduate from the Cornell Law School. Thank you very much for coming during the lunch hour and giving me this opportunity to present to you. I will also give my sincere gratitude to Mr. Glasser for offering me such a great opportunity to share my thoughts here in the board bank and also for giving me the great uh, instructions during the whole semester. And Mr. Open, thank you very much for your comments. Okay. Now let's begin. My topic today is the problems of land organization and land-based finance in China. So firstly, let me introduce the structure of my presentation today. At the beginning, I would like to um, briefly introduce the definition of land organization in China to you. And then I will show you the pro uh, prominent problems in land organization in the whole process. Um, and then I will point out the substance of all of these problems is the unbalanced benefit allocation and the land-based finance. Then I will give a brief introduction of land-based finance in China. Finally, I will try to show you some solutions to the land-based finance and all, all the problems during the process. Okay, so firstly, what is land urbanization in China? According to the Land Administration Law of People's Republic of China, the rural land is owned by peasants, and the urban land is owned by the state. The state can, for the public interest, expropriate the land with compensation. And the <coughs> urban developers in urban areas who need the land for construction must apply for to use the land which is owned by the state by paying the charges for the assignment of land use rights. So after the assignment, the land use rights can be transferred in the real estate market. So you can see according to the law, um, the definition of land urbanization in China is a process that the rural land is expropriated by the state with compensation and then assigned to enterprises and individuals with charges and then transacted <coughs> among enterprises and individuals. So now let's have, let's have a look at the prominent problems of our land urbanization in China, including the conflicts in demolition, the high housing price, and the gap between urbanization of land and urbanization of population. So um, firstly, the demolition produces a lot of conflict. Sorry. So, this process includes the recruitment of the residents and their housing sites on the land which is expropriated by the state. So I think the main reason why there are so uh, many conflicts is because that the peasants cannot get enough compensation. So you can see from this cartoon, the compensation for every square meter is only 41 yuan. And further, because the housing price in cities is very high and even is increasing, rapidly, so both the uh, ordinary people in cities and also the peasants who have just moved into the cities cannot afford to buy a house, house or even an apartment. So you can see the peasants moving into the cities uh, have lost their land, their housing size in their original home and cannot find an official job or a new housing so they can just float in the cities. So you can see that the urbanization um, it's just land organization, but not population organization. So uh, this is the gap between the land organization and people organization. So you may wonder what's the substance of all these problems. So I think uh, the substance is the unbalanced benefit allocation uh, and the land-based finance practice of Chinese local governments. So, um, what is land-based finance? Uh, briefly, it is um, the process that local governments obtain charges for the, for the assignment of land use rights as a main source of revenue. You can see from this, you can see from this image, uh, this means the revenue from selling land. And the local government is shouting, this is my main source of revenue. So, uh, why did I say that uh, the original cause of all the problems in the process is the uh, land-based finance. So under land-based finance, you can see the local government, this is the local government. The local government obtains the ownership of the land 
and then the urban developer obtained the, uh, the use right of the land. And during the, the assignment and the development of this piece of land, both of them has obtained a lot of benefit from the whole process. <coughs> but the peasants can only get very low compensation. According to the land administration law in China, the compensation is only based on the original use, but not the future use of the land. So its price is far less than the market price. So um, realizing their losing position, uh, the peasants now are reluctant to be expropriated. So now you can see this is why there are some conflicts in the process of demolition. And further, because the land-based finance is a very important source of revenue of local governments, they now are trying to artificially increase the price of the land as much as possible. So as a result, the, the housing price in cities is very high. And as I discussed just now, um, both ordinary people in cities and the moving in peasants cannot afford to buy housing. So it leads to uh, the gap between land organization and population organization. Um, Actually, we had to admit, admit that um, the land-based finance practices of Chinese local governments have uh, constri contributed a lot to infrastructure const construction and also the economic development of China during the past decades. However, especially in recent years, there have been a lot of disadvantages. Apart from the uh, unbalanced benefit allocation we discussed just now, uh, there are also other disadvantages, including the use of land with low efficiency and waste, and also the invasion of cultivated land, and the artificial uh, factors, including corrupt corruption and rent seeking. So, uh, what about the future of land-based finance in China? So, uh, the payment by the uh, developers to the local governments, which entitle them to use the land for several de decades, so um, after using out all the uh, capital from this kind of revenue, no onward revenue will, would be um, left for the subsequent local governments. So you can see that uh, this system is unsustainable. So once the, all the land is sold out, this whole system will collapse. Okay, so up to now we have, see, uh, we have seen that the root of all the problems during the process of land organization is the land-based finance. And the future of land-based finance is really dangerous. So we have to find solutions to land-based finance and then um, to solve the problems in land organization. So basically, I think there are two paths to solve this problem. Firstly, if we can radically seize the system of land-based finance, because it is the root, then all the problems can surely be solved. And secondly, uh, if we cannot end the system radically at this moment, at least we can make some improvements under this system, which can also be helpful to solve the problem. Okay, uh, for the radical reforms of land-based finance, now let's first have a look at the first solution, uh, the direct sale of land use rights from peasants to developers. So, um, the direct sale between the uh, developers and peasants means that the main two, the two core steps of land-based finance, which is the uh, expropriation and assignment, would be eliminated. So as a result, there would be a lot of advantages. Firstly, because in this system, the peasants would be equal to the developers, so they can argue for a higher price of the land based on the future use rather than the, uh, the original use of this land. So as a result, more benefit would be allocated to peasants. And also, because the complex process of expropriation and assignment of land would give a lot of chances to local government uh, of corruption and rent seeking. So uh, this kind of direct transactions would protect the peasants from the illegal actions of the local governments. And finally, because um, if the local governments lose their power to sell land, they will not um, any longer artificially raise the price of the land. So finally, the housing price will be stabilized. So uh, despite of 
all of these advantages, there are also challenges to the solution. So firstly, as I said just now, uh, the rural land in China is owned by peasants and the urban land is owned by the state. However, the developers can only apply for urban land which is owned by the state. So this means, um, theoretically, there is no legal basis for this kind of direct transaction between the peasants and developers. Uh, further, I think the dual urban rural structure does not only include legal dimension, but also include uh, political, um, economic, and cultural factors in China. So, you know, it is very difficult to break out this system at this moment. And also, uh, because land-based finance has been a very important source of revenue for local governments, so there would be surely resistance from them. And finally, I think at this moment, the peasants in China uh, do not have enough power, experience, and knowledge to um, directly negotiate with the urban developers. So these are all the difficulties. Okay, now let's move to the second solution of radical reforms of land-based finance to replace land assignment charges with property tax. Here, by property tax, I mean the tax levied on the land and the housing properties on this piece of land which are held or transacted by individuals and inmates in China. Um, actually, uh, since 1986, China has begun to collect property tax across the whole country. But for this kind of property tax, the objects that, uh, do not include the residential housing, which actually is a very important part uh, of the property uh, of the real estate market. So since 2011, uh, the two pilot cities, Shanghai and Chongqing, uh, have begun to collect new property, property tax from the residential housing, this means the residential housing, to, as a method to stabilize the price of the housing. So, at this moment, many commentators and scholars are happy to say that it is the time to replace the uh, <coughs> land assignment charges with the combination of new property tax and old property. So uh, let, let's see what's the advantages of property tax compared with the land-based finance. Firstly, uh, as for uh, the legal basis of these two methods, the land assignment charges uh, is based on the large area of uh, housing properties for investment. So the collection of property tax would be a very effective way to uh, restrict the undue speculation in real estate market. And finally, because the crazy investment in real estate market will cool down, then the investment will go to other areas. So it is very helpful to improve the industrial structure of a city. Okay, so is it really feasible to replace the land assignment charges with property tax? So now let's first have a look at the current accomplishment in the two experimental cities, Shanghai and Chongqing. So according <coughs> to the available data, actually there is not very obvious uh, accomplish accomplishment at this moment. On one hand, <coughs> uh, on one hand uh, according to the data, the, pro the collection of property tax has not helped a lot to restricting the housing price. So in other words, the housing price is still raising very quickly. And on the other hand, uh, the contribution of the collection of property tax is far less than the land use rights assignment charges, which means that there is a large financing gap if we try to make this replacement. <coughs> However, um, according to some scholars, it is also possible in the long term to make this replacement for the following reasons. Firstly, because as I said just now, uh, the land available for uh, assignment is going to be exhausted. So the amount of the collection of land assignment charges would decrease finally. And on the other hand, because the spread of collection of property tax across the country and also because the large demand of housing in cities, so there will be more and more of objects to property tax. So with these two um, opposite trends, we will finally find that the amount of the property tax will exceed 
the former one. So at this moment, if we want to cover the financing uh, gap, which is produced in short term, uh, we can make some methods, including the partial replacement of land assignment charges, and also reducing the uh, inefficient expenditure of local governments, or we can ask him for support from the central government and province governments in China. Okay, so we talked about Shanghai and Chongqing, the two experimental cities just now, and now I would like to, based on the experience in these two cities, and give some advice to the uh, prospective pilot cities. So for taxpayer, uh, I think we should include both the owners and the users of the housing properties. And for tax objects, we should both include the already held and the newly bought luxury properties. And for the tax rates, I think we need to use both um, progressive rates and differential rates. For the preferential policy, I think it should respond to the reasonable need of residents in cities and also the development of society. And um, the disadvantaged people, including the elderly and disabled, should also be taken into consideration. So, um, what about the final target of this method? I mean, uh, the collection of property tax. So, I think it's the national uniform legislation. It is necessary because, actually, at this moment, the collection of both the uh, collection of new property and old property are illegal because they violate the law of People's Republic of China on the administration of tax collection and also uh, it violates provisional regulations of China's people, uh, People's Republic of China for housing property tax. So um, theoretically to explain this briefly, so uh, the collection of property tax at this moment is not authorized by the national law which is legislated by the National <coughs> People's Congress which, is, which has the highest legal effect, and also because it violates its upper law, upper law and national law. So, uh, you see, it is necessary to legislate a national law to, regulating, to regulate the collection of property tax. So if the central government decides to do so, I think they should first solve some problems of the current collection, including the inadequate taxation objects, and also the improper tax categories, and also the improper tax base. Okay, so up to now, uh, we have seen that there are two solutions for the radical reforms of land-based finance. So you can see that they are both very exciting, but uh, there are also very serious challenges and, and difficulties. So if we cannot make these radical reforms, I think we can make some improvements under the system. So firstly, I think we should uh, solve the unbalanced benefit allocation in the stage of expropriation. We can do this by uh, reforming the calculation of the compensation for peasants, and also by making the process of expropriation and assignments more clear and concise and also can do this by involving the peasants in the stage of negotiation. And also, um, we should change the administrative model of China to market model. So by, uh, to do this, we can put the land transfer into, land, into market mechanism, and also by defining and limiting the role of local governments in real estate market. And thirdly, we should also try to weaken the factors which force the local governments to rely on land-based finance. Uh, so we can do this by adjusting the finance and tax relationship between central government and local governments. And also by reforming the evaluation system of uh, the government <coughs> officials. And also by uh, developing other industries. So uh, another task is to take advantage of the national macro control policies. So include these policies include standardizing the regulation of land of construction and developing economically affordable housing and enhancing the regulation of demolition. So finally, about the extra budgetary revenue. So 
uh, in many cities in China, the land, charge, land assignment charges and also the tax and fees regarding the land are out of the budget of a city. So it is also um, subject to artificial factors and relates to corruptions and not so standardized regulation. So we should now put them into the budget of these cities to make them more strict and standardized. Okay, so now maybe we can come to the conclusion that uh, the land-based finance is the root of the problems during the land urbanization process in China. And to solve this, uh, this, kind of this system and all these problems, we can uh, radically make some reforms of the land-based finance. Um, the result may be exciting, but there are a lot of difficulties and challenges on the road. So at least we can make some improvements at this moment, which can also be helpful to solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, I love urban law, right? We've got so much stuff happening in China. We've got, you know, questions of fundamental fairness uh, towards the peasants as the cities grow. We've got questions of how do we finance our cities and their infrastructure. We've got questions of whether the legal and regulatory framework is going to need to be changed. It, it's really an exciting uh, set of challenges. And um, <coughs> We're going to come back for discussion after we hear Moss's presentation. Moss is now going to take us, he's going to zoom in on a very specific problem of how cities relate to the people, especially the poor people, in their cities, um, and specifically in Johannesburg. So Masa, without further ado, I will turn over to you.